Okay, hi everyone. Uh, welcome to today's webinar, uh, Global Growth Unleashed, where we'll be looking into how AI is helping businesses reach a global audience. Uh, we're going to be hearing from some great panelists today about their views on localization and how AI and technology are powering workflows behind the scenes uh, to power global reach. And we'll be giving everyone uh, attending a chance to join in, uh, and we'll kick things off in a second. So today, uh, we're really lucky to be joined by uh, two great uh, guests uh, to give their views and insights into a global view on localization and the technology that powers it. Uh, firstly, we're going to hear from uh, Diego Karuna from HubSpot, who will be talking about how localization uh, powers global expansion. Uh, followed by Tobias Scher from Phrase, who will be uh, sharing how technology can streamline uh, localization workflows. Then you'll have me, Paul, uh, where I'll uh, talk through some of the key headlines from our recent survey, the state of website localization, and sharing what we at DeepL think uh, this means for localization and the machine translation landscape. Uh, lastly, we're going to open up uh, the floor for our Q&A session, uh, which I'll discuss in more detail next. So just covering a few uh, pieces of housekeeping, uh, just to let you know, uh, we're going to be recording the webinar, but uh, obviously your attendance will remain anonymous and uh, will not share your details with anyone else. Um, for everyone who registered, uh, whether they're attending or not, uh, they'll get a link to the recording after we've finished. So uh, you're obviously free to share that with colleagues uh, within your organizations. Uh, last thing to mention for the Q&A, please feel free to start dropping your questions uh, into the Q&A function within Zoom, uh, not the Zoom chat, as uh, they could be missed. And obviously, we want to get as many of your questions answered as possible. Uh, we'll open up the Q&A uh, function very shortly, uh, so you can start adding your questions in advance. Uh, obviously, if your question is uh, specifically for one of the panelists here, or uh, if you have a specific topic you want to cover, please make sure you mention that so it can be uh, directed to uh, the right people. Uh, before we start, uh, we're going to get into the main track of today's webinar. I'll just do a quick round of uh, introductions. So I'm Paul, a technical product marketing manager here at Deepel, working with the API team. Uh, relatively new face around here, uh, but generally I help uh, putting together technical content for developers uh, to help them find value in the uh, Deepel API. Uh, in the background, we've got Mike Winters, a technical product manager here at uh, the API team, uh, who may or may not make an appearance later on, but uh, will be fielding any questions relating to the actual uh, building blocks of the Deepel API itself. Uh, and so on to the uh, main event. Uh, first up, uh, we have Dirk Runa from uh, HubSpot. Uh, so Dirk, I'll uh, stop sharing my screen and uh, uh, let you share yours and uh, introduce yourself fully. All right, thank you very much. Um, as Paul mentioned, my name is Dirk. Um, I'm sen Senior Manager for Product Localizations and Systems at HubSpot. That means I am looking after our software localization as well as after our uh, our localization tech stack. I guess I'm sort of the tech guy in the company. Um, I'm also moonlighting as a product manager because I also look after the custom development efforts that we do at HubSpot um, that are related to localization. And that's kind of going to be a, a focus point uh, for me today, um, just to show some of the things that, that we have done um, in-house in order to uh, to leverage the technology that we have uh, to, to really be applied um, at scale. So um, in my presentation, uh, I'm going to talk a bit, uh, first up, I'm going to talk a bit about uh, the company itself, how localization at, at HubSpot is structured. Um, and then I'm going to uh, move into um, our tech stack and um, what we have what we have done, some of the stuff that, that we have done internally um, to really make that tech stack come together, which has been a, a multi-year process um, at this point. Um, and in that, I also want to show how we um, leverage tools like machine translation, like DeepL, um, in, um, in our day-to-day. -day. All right. In the first section, uh, I'll give you a bit of an overview of the company itself, how localization at the company works. Um, I'll try to keep that as brief as possible, but I do feel it's, it's um, good context to have um, for the remainder of, um, of the presentation. Um, First up, a little bit about the company for those who don't know it. HubSpot is a software as a service company founded in 2005, um, headquartered in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, our primary product of the same names, also called HubSpot, is um, a free to use customer relationship management CRM platform. 
um, basically a tool that businesses can use to run their operations, their website, their marketing, their sales, their services, and so on, uh, their customer service and so on. Um, in fact, HubSpot itself runs uh, runs on HubSpot. We we run pretty much all of our operations on our own software. Um, so we're kind of our own, I guess, guinea pig and test case at the same time. And that also applies to localization for a certain degree. Um, localization at HubSpot, I guess, is we, we tend to push the localization related boundaries of our own of our own software a bit. Um, Apart from the from the baseline CRM platform, we do have a set of premium products um, that are that offer additional tools for specific areas. For example, additional marketing tools if you want to run email campaigns, if you want to uh, run uh, campaigns for paid social media marketing, and so on. Um, these days, the company has around 175,000 customers across over 100 countries, and we also have a fairly extensive partner ecosystem both on the product side, so that's third-party integrations into, into our platform, um, as well as on the marketing and sales side. So um, our customers can work with partners to make sure that they leverage the platform optimally. Um, and you can hire, for example, marketing partners, um, agencies who do your marketing for you in the HubSpot software. One thing that's uh, that's quite I want to say different about HubSpot is that HubSpot has always positioned itself as a, as a thought leader in the marketing and sales industry. Our founders pioneered what's known as the inbound methodology, um, a customer-centric consultative approach to marketing and sales, um, which is now conceptualized as the HubSpot flywheel, which is the graph that you see on the right here. Unfortunately, given the time today, I don't have, I can't get into this in, in a lot of detail, but I did include a link um, at the bottom there. So if anyone is interested in reading up more on the topic, um, that's where we, you'll find all of the details. Um, the reason I bring up the inbound methodology, uh, again, we we kind of drink our own Kool-Aid, so to speak. Um, we, uh, we also follow the inbound methodology. And because of that, the company has traditionally had a um, a fairly strong focus on content marketing across like the whole spectrum of content. So that's anything from blogs, ebooks, white papers, e-learning content, webinars, audiovisual assets, the whole shebang. And that in turn has also kind of uh, shaped our approach to localization um, because it was kind of born out of the necessity to to bring this level of content marketing into into different languages, into different markets. So HubSpot has a centralized team. Right now, we're about 30 people. Um, and traditionally, the team has been heavily focused on the marketing uh, the marketing side of things. That's that's where the team kind of started out. We have since um, sort of spread out into, into pretty much all areas of the business, including obviously software localization, which is which is where my team comes in, um, but also our knowledge, knowledge base, developer documentation, and so on. Um, the majority uh, of the folks on the team are uh, linguists and project managers, so a very traditional split. Um, and we do, do also have some specialized positions for um, desktop publishing, for vendor management, um, internal enablement, and so on. Not everything is is handled in house. We do work quite extensively with external with external vendors and um, and freelancers. Um, and the way that we structure this work is basically uh, done through through language tiering, um, fairly you know a fairly common approach, um, where we have six um, core languages. Um, those are the languages that we where we support our entire operations across the board. So we run the website, the documentation, the e-learning content, um, and those are also the languages for which we for which we have um, internal linguistic resources. Then we have sort of a second layer of uh, of non-core languages. Um, those are languages that we that we support in our software and our documentation, um, but where typically we're heavily reliant on outsourcing. And then there's a long tail of so-called end-user languages. Those are uh, languages where we have a fairly limited scope of of translated content that we provide. That's mostly to make sure that users of our software um, can use the software to run. Uh, to run their operations in different languages. So for example, if you want to run um, your website, in your Vietnamese language website on HubSpot, you want to make sure that you can actually do that and that you have all of the, you know, all of the, the, the translation, the, the pre-written translations available that you need to do that. Um, finally, one area where I guess localization at HubSpot is a little bit different from that at other companies is uh, the extraordinarily high number of tools that we have to interface with. 
um, that can be for integration purposes. It can be like the localization team is the end user of those of those tools, um, or it might just be because we need to extract content for translation from some tool. Um, because HubSpot is a very product driven company, and I mentioned that you know we tend to use our own our own tools. We also mostly build internal tools uh, for ourselves, which can somewhat exacerbate this situation. Um, and it, it kind of forces us to have sub-specializations on the team. Not everyone can know like every like niche tool and niche uh, process that, that they might have to deal with at some point or that localization might have to deal with at some point. Um, and yeah, we also need to make sure that our internal documentation is on the up and up. Um, this has also required us um, to invest quite a bit in custom development internally um, because there are a whole number of use cases um, that we otherwise wouldn't really be able to serve um, as as well as we as we would want. And that's kind of what I'm going to talk about in this next section. Um, so here I want to take a look at our tech stack. Um, I want to look how we leverage the technology to scale localization operations um, in order to support uh, the company's growth. Um, we, at the, in the localization team at HubSpot, we pretty much constantly have to, to like, consider how we can improve uh, and better leverage and evolve our tools um, simply in order to keep pace with the, the company internal localization use cases. There's new stuff coming up all the time. That's kind of the extension of um, of the uh, sort of approach to marketing that I mentioned earlier. Um, because if right, like the, the world of marketing is is changing fairly rapidly. So if a new tool, a new channel, a new technology comes online that um, that we want to leverage for marketing, then we in the localization team have to kind of figure out. How, how we can follow suit and make sure that we enable that across languages. The same it applies to existing to existing processes uh, or existing use cases. They, they might change their workflow, they might change tools, uh, they might want to extend their language coverage or increase their volume. Um, so we're never short on things to, uh, to, that we have to react to and, and that we have to figure out how to, um, how to accommodate in our processes. All right, apologies for just throwing a whole bunch of logos at you. Um, this is a look at most of our tech stack, um, roughly sort of categorized. Um, these are the most central, most used tools. There's plenty of other tools uh, available, most of them for fairly niche applications and processes. Um, everything that's listed here is connected with at least one, probably multiple of the other tools listed. Uh, that can be anything from a native integration to a custom developed solution. Um, and out of the tools listed here, I would say Jira is probably the most pivotal one. It is our, our control center, our source of truth, and the, the sort of starting and, and connecting point for a lot of, for a lot of, a lot of the automation that we have um, internally at the company. Um, on the translation side of things, we have two translation management systems, MemoQ and TransFX. MemoQ is typically what we use for sort of the marketing side of things. TransFX is what we tend to use in, um, in our software localization. Um, and then uh, as machine translation providers, we primarily leverage DeepL and ModernMT. Those are, of course, also available in the context of our, um, of our TMSs. So generally, I assume people will be familiar with most of, most of the tools that are um, on this list with at least one exception, which is uh, right in the center, MOVA. So MOVA is an internally developed system that um, I will now attempt to, to demo for you. Um, hopefully nothing goes wrong, um, which is sort of an, um, MOVA is technically an umbrella term for a bunch of different systems that are interconnected. Really at the, at the core of it, underlying all of it in, are several database tables where we track all of our web content, our Jira tickets, our MemoQ projects, our MemoQ statistics. Uh, we tr everything that these tools give us in terms of data, we try to collect in that central repository because that's um, that's sort of the baseline that we use for our um, for our automation um, purposes. So I'm just going to switch over. This is the interface um, of Mova. What you're seeing here is a list of the different uh, web assets, landing pages, website pages, blog posts, and so on, that we monitor in our own content management system. Again, as a reminder, HubSpot runs on HubSpot. So this is coming out of the HubSpot CMS. 
uh, you can see here we're, we're currently monitoring 76,500 something um, assets. Um, this is in real time. Um, you can see like something got, was updated a couple of seconds ago. Um, and yeah, this is monitoring basically multiple HubSpot, um, HubSpot instances um, for the content they're in. Uh, for everything that we, that we are monitoring, we have a whole bunch of data points, um, obviously IDs, update dates, create dates, um, publication status, and so on. There's a, whole, um, there's a whole list of data points that we can use here. And all of these can also be used to filter um, to filter for certain assets. Um, so for example, if I wanted to see anything that was updated last week, all of the blog posts that were updated last week, um, which are available in French. So we bring down the list of 70, 76,000 assets to 118 blog posts were updated last week that have a, a French version um, available. So um, that's kind of, that, that's kind of how MOVA started out, but that's not all. Over time, we did add a lot of additional um, sort of translation related capacity to it. And this is where DeepL and ModernMT come in. I'm gonna switch to our staging environment just so that I'm not, um, that I'm not messing with our production, uh, with our production um, assets. One sec for the login. All right, here we are. So this is this is in our QA environment. Never mind the the fact that you know all the assets here have like test names. Um, I'm just really quickly going to create a new asset. So this is in the HubSpot software, and I'm just going to create a new blog post um, to show how this shows up in in Mova. I mentioned that this that this is real time um, real time tracking. Um, so we'll create a blog post. I'll grab some filler content. And then we can just publish that. There we go. I guess this will become the title. Um, and we need to select an author. We need to have a meta description. And this needs to be turned off and we can publish. All right, so I've just published this blog post. Obviously it's not a real blog post, um, but just to show what this looks like um, once we return to MOVA, if I hit refresh, uh, we should see, there we go. That's our English blog post right there. And now what I can do is I can just machine translate this blog post. So if I want this blog post in Danish, let's say, I want it published right away. Um, I would be getting in the background, I would be getting some Slack notifications. I've turned them off for my uh, for the webinar, um, but you can see it here. And that's it. Uh, we now have We now have a Danish version of this blog post live and available. Um, this is what that this is what that looks like. So um, that's sort of the first piece. Um, we have we have machine translation built into this into this system. Um, and the next step from here is that we can now automate this. So if I build a filter like I've I've shown before, right? Like I can filter for assets um, in, in our list here. I'm just going to do that now, store this as a filter configuration. We'll call this webinar demo. And obviously, like this is a pretty this is a pretty bad filter to use because it's I'm literally just looking for this one for this one blog post. But um, this can be done, for example, for all of the blog posts on our knowledge base, for all of the website pages on our in our developer documentation, or only um, website pages on a certain subdomain that are missing a certain language or so on. Um, I can use this to set up an automated workflow. Um, we use the filter that I just created. And let's time, let's go with traditional Chinese. Um, we pick the type of workflow that we want. We have a couple of different options. Uh, we can go with raw machine translation. We can use machine translation with leveraging our translation memories whenever we have them. And we can also go machine translation with human in the loop. So that's post editing or full human translation, human review. Uh, for the sake of brevity, I'm just gonna um, use raw machine translation here, um, select a Slack channel where notifications should go, and that's it. Um, the workflow is set up. So basically what this means is whenever a, 
uh, an asset that falls under this the filter that I just created is updated, it will now be translated into uh, traditional Chinese as well. And just to demonstrate that, uh, we'll pick a little bit more of our random content here. Add it to the list, sorry, to the to the article and update it. And once again, I should be I should now be getting um, Slack notifications that let me know uh, that hey, we, this are art, this article was up, just updated. There was no existing article for this in Chinese. It has now been created and it has been uh, and it has been published. Oops, this is the wrong link. My apologies. If I go through the mobile UI, we should be seeing it. So we now also have a Chinese article here um, that uh, that is live and published. And basically, the, the whole point that I want to make with this is that this can be used to uh, to scale basically to any size and any supported languages that you want. Obviously, um, you have to be you have to be very careful. Um, you have to be very careful to only do that with content um, where you would want uh, to to leverage machine translation to this degree. Um, anything that needs a human uh, human review or maybe even human translation um, can be uh, uh, can be filtered through a different workflow. Um, and because we have the data to um, to do this based on the performance uh, uh, the performance metrics of of our assets, we can, for example. Um, and this is this is something that we do in, in fact for our for our knowledge base for example um we send articles that have a high view count that are viewed more often through human in the loop workflows whereas the long tail um, less viewed articles would go um, through a different workflow all right uh, looking at the time uh, I'm about to wrap up um just to close out my presentation I, I want to quickly touch uh, upon a couple of the things that we have learned in um in localization at HubSpot and in, in growing localization at HubSpot. Um, I suppose most of these are, are would generally be for uh, company internal uh, localization teams. And I suppose for companies who are trying to figure out how they should think about localization. So number one is executive support. Executive support is absolutely crucial. Um, ideally, that means you have a pre-planned top-down approach to localization. That's great if you can get it, but it's also, wildly unrealistic i uh, i feel um typically you know we all know localization at, a co at companies typically starts because someone just starts doing it kind of out of sheer necessity but even in that case i would make the point that um you want to try to educate up the management chain wherever possible and make sure that management understands the additional value the team provides speaking of internal localization teams should drive additional value apart from the core translation piece. The core translation piece obviously uh, must always be there. Um, but really what we have found is um, in order to, to really cement the value of the team at a, uh, within the context of a company, um, you need to look for additional sort of outlets, I guess. Our approach to that has been on the one hand, sort of a full service translation uh, localization approach where we really take on a lot of the um, a lot of the project management burden from, from our stakeholders in the company. It has been focused on enablement and consulting. So if we basically take teams who have never translated or localized anything and we kind of guide them throughout the entire uh, throughout the entire process. And lastly, obviously my wheelhouse is custom development. And here I really would want to make the point that having technological literacy and the capability to come up with technological solutions for the challenges that you and your stakeholders face is absolutely pivotal for for internal localization teams um you will also need the capability to implement these solutions but that's actually more flexible right like it doesn't necessarily mean you have to have dedicated engineering headcount um there are other ways to execute uh, something like that that can be outsourced there are low and no code options that you can go with depending on what's within your means and then finally, um, and this one kind of is very common sense, is uh, happy stakeholders are worth their weight in gold for internal localization teams, right? You want to make sure that you stay in close contact with them, especially when it comes to planning season. Um, make sure to sync up with them to understand how will they grow next year? Are they planning to grow? What are the new initiatives that they are looking to, um, to, looking to roll out? Are there new channels, new playbooks that they are looking to develop? Uh, because you want to make sure that once those come into play, you are already there to, and know this is how we can handle that for localization. Um, 
at HubSpot, we use we use like regular surveys with our stakeholders to to understand like what their feedback is and if there's anything that they want to um, that they want to share with us. We also give out internal rewards to to recognize, uh, especially like diligent and localization friendly uh, stakeholders, and that all kind of helps to build up localization as an um, I suppose as an institution um, in, in the company. And those stakeholders will tend to be your most your most enthusiastic promoters. All right, that brings me to the end. I hope um, you found this at least somewhat somewhat interesting and useful. Um, apologies for uh, for like taking another five minutes for this. Thank you, Dick. Uh, I don't think anybody's going to be uh, questioning that. I think it was uh, uh, incredibly in depth and uh, you know really interesting, especially uh, seeing somebody's internal tool as well, which is uh, always amazing to see. So thank you very much for that. Uh, so quickly moving on, um, uh, Tobias, uh, warm welcome to you. And uh, again, I'll uh, let you uh, do your own introduction and uh, off you go. Sounds good. Thank you. Share my screen. It's coming through. Okay. All right. Should be there. All right. So yes, I'm I'm Tobias Scherf. Uh, I'm the director of solutions here at Phrase, operating from the West Coast United States. Um, Phrase, you might not everybody may know Phrase, uh, at least not the history, right? Of Phrase, ultimately uh, going back to Memsers. Uh, Memsers is uh, the company that we originally came from. Uh, ultimately, the the founding company was in, or the founding organization was in, is headquartered in Prague. Is still there. Uh, then, uh, a few years back, we actually acquired Phrase, the company Phrase, uh, that's uh, out of Germany, uh, Hamburg, uh, and ultimately then. Uh, last year decided to uh, uh, rebrand and become Phrase uh, as a holistic company. So we're now named Phrase. Uh, it's a little, little bit confusing uh, just to give you kind of the background of where this all comes from. But uh, yeah, Phrase is, is our new brand name and uh, we're having now a product of suites ultimately that uh, we support. So let me dive in. Um, one of the aspects, of course, that that phrase has been looking at achieving is is creating a whole suite of localization suite of products, right? So we started with with original Mamsers, uh, now phrase TMS, and uh, acquired uh, phrase ultimately and became part of this this organization and brought strings to the table and uh, phrase strings essentially a software localization platform while phrase TMS was you know, kind of a mix of both, a full-fledged translation management system that can allow you to do software localization, but is also heavily geared toward, towards integrations with marketing automation systems or content management systems. Um, so today we've expanded that suite even further, and you'll see that we have new core products, phrase strings and TMS, where you can do your localization work. Uh, but uh, in addition to that, we've also just launched uh, this year phrase orchestrator, which is a low code, no code environment to uh, facilitate the additional automations kind of give you a glance at that there's not a lot of time to go deep into it today uh, and then uh, of course phrase translate uh, which is part of the tms solution uh, and that's an ai based layer on top of machine translation i'll talk a little bit about that and see what that looks like today uh, as well as we just also launched this year uh, a revamp of our analytics engine directly in platform uh, with phrase analytics all right um Phrase Translate, uh, one of our core products and probably one that aligns well with discussion today here, also both with uh, DPAL in the mix and then uh, later also HubSpot, uh, is an AI layer on top of machine translation. So we're aggregating multiple uh, MT providers into a single interface for you as part of the TMS platform that allows you as a user to enable whichever MT providers you want to use. Uh, and you can uh, uh, essentially enable multiple of them uh, and will help you pick the most relevant MT provider given the content domain and the language where you're translating into. Uh, we consistently measure that performance in the background. So we know based on human feedback, which engine provider is actually doing best for your content. And we will then make the proper selection for you. And that's a document-based selection. All right. In, in addition to that, Phrase Translate also brings into the mix machine translation glossaries, uh, MT glossaries and synchronization to the providers that support them, like DeepL. Uh, and uh, we also provide empty QE scoring or machine translation quality estimations. 
Um, with French Translate, we've seen customers achieve an additional like 55% uh, in, 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 in cost savings, uh, generally speaking, because of some of the features that we provide, right? Uh, that includes terminology uh, integration. It includes also making sure that the right MT is available when it's needed. Um, and that language pairs are covered right uh, across the board not every mt provider necessarily provides always the same set of languages or is the strongest in every language combination um so certainly we're trying to to make that mix happen and and rather than having a single single vendor strategy in that sense uh giving you options ultimately to to connect you with the the ideal one at the time um that leads me also further to the next slide, which actually highlights some of the um, providers and their metrics, right? And and what that looks like. So this was Q1 data. Actually, Q2 data is is maybe out already. I have to check. Our MT MT uh, report is is being released, if not shortly. Um, so for uh, Q1 data. Um, we had, you know, this kind of mix of um, of usage in our platform. So we're measuring Google, Microsoft, DeepL, Amazon. You can see are the primary ones, and DeepL actually kind of neck on neck from a usage perspective, right? With Google, uh, it's pretty impressive, actually. Um, and uh, in Q2 so far, from from what I heard, DeepL is actually now taking lead. So um, you can see one that speaks to the quality aspect, of course, of DeepL as a provider, a uh, really strong provider in the mix of all the major players here in the in the MT industry. Um, and then further here on the right graph, uh, we can also see that same breakdown uh, by domain, content domain. And you can see that out of seven of the domains that we've measured for Chinese, for instance, so English to Chinese, uh, DeepL was the strongest, right? from a quality perspective. So you can see that blue bar uh, across the board in that last sector in these domains uh, is where DeepL is actually in Q1 was the, the preferred engine. All right. Um, that brings me to integration. So part of course of optimizing your localization workflow isn't just the integration of machine translation solutions with phrase, right? And using AI technology, uh, to st to streamline that uh, sort of user experience, right, and make it very simple. And that's that's at the core of what we do is we're trying to really make things simple and attainable for everybody. Uh, it, it's it's not always easy, um, and it's not always easy to connect things. Uh, and so we're trying to bring everything into your at your fingertips ultimately and connect it into a seamless workflow. And uh, part of that is, of course, the integrations. Uh, so we have a number of different integrations, including uh, with HubSpot, who's here today with Dirk, right? And uh, a number of other players in the CMS uh, or uh, marketing automation uh, sector, documentation, storage, and so on. You can see there's a number of different products we support, and that's just a, a, a few of them here on this slide, right? There's uh, 50 uh, or over 50 in, in total that we have. So with that, uh, let me maybe jump straight into a demo and actually show you um, what that looks like in practice, like what our integrations look like and what also uh, the, um, so with, with, for instance, DeepL and what it looks like for HubSpot. So we'll see a demo that's essentially taking HubSpot content, moving it into phrase, and it's uh, going to select MT. Uh, I should select uh, DeepL actually in this case, at least on, on previous trials, that's what happened. All right. So let me jump over. I'm going to move my bar here a bit. All right. So we have this piece of content that's a, a landing page essentially inside of um, HubSpot here. So I have that prepared. It's just a, a basic uh, template here that I've used uh, with some content uh, for translation, right? So similar to what Dirk showed earlier uh, with his blog post. Um, now what I'll do is I'll go to first phrase translate and give you an idea of what phrase translate looks like. So the configuration that I'm going to be using is this one here is using a, an empty profile inside of phrase translate that has the following uh, engines enabled currently. So what I mentioned earlier in the slide essentially in practice here phrase next MT Google DeepL, and Amazon are enabled here and I can easily toggle on or off additional players if I want to right. Um, You'll see also that uh, down below here, there is a um, empty glossary integration. So 
or I be able to synchronize my glossaries with any provider uh, that's attached here to my profile uh, to ensure that each provider can insert the proper terminology into the translated content and then return it back, right? Uh, DeepL does a good job at that. Uh, it's also, you know, providing morphologically correct insertions of terminology. Uh, NextMT is another provider, or our own MT engine that does that, uh, while Google, Amazon, the others don't, right? Um, uh, an additional note about NextMT, which is also something we released uh, not too long ago, uh, is another option for, for machine translation. Uh, it's a little bit different from a, from a purely generic engine in that we are actually leveraging the TM content that's inside of our platform. Uh, so we can play on top of the, MT, uh, the translated, translated content that already exists and use fuzzy matches to improve the translations, right? Um, all right, let me go into my automation piece. So uh, we've got an automation set up. So this is via integration to HubSpot. Now I'm going to ultimately be picking up that content. You can see right now, I have no project here, um, but ultimately will in, in just a short second. And, and what I'm going to be doing is ultimately pull that piece of content in that we've, we've seen here from HubSpot. Um, and that can happen either on a cadence schedule. You can see that it has a scheduled trigger here. Uh, it can also happen with systems that uh, allow it via uh, webhooks. So it can be almost instantaneously if you wanted to, right? So as long as we have net web in webhook integration with a partner system, we can also launch uh, essentially as soon as um, something gets published or something gets changed, right? Depending on the level of integration a third party has. Um, so this can be trigger events. For us, uh, in this case, it's cadence, and I'm going to just essentially import this um, at will. Uh, rather than waiting for the cadence schedule to execute. All right, so if I refresh my screen, uh, I got kicked out there. One second. All right, should be back. All right, so here we see our PubSpot project um, is created finally. And uh, if I jump into here, you can see you already uh, went through part of the process. So machine translation was already carried out and we're actually currently in the second workflow step, which is post editing. And that's already also been auto assigned. So I can set this configuration up to fully automatically pick content up from HubSpot when there is new content to process or there's an update uh, of content in HubSpot. It can directly be uh, funneled through a pipeline or workflow of your choice. It could be machine translation, could be human translation, whatever it is you want and you can couple it any way you need uh, and this can also then as you see here directly be assigned so you don't have to babysit this from a project management perspective but you can maintain a high level oversight of what's going on in your system and in your production um, when i open these there's like essentially a job for every language that i've selected and this gonna was executed into french and german uh, we can see that i'll open both here All right, we can see the translations are in, they're French as expected, and we see DeepL is the chosen language uh, provider here, the chosen MT provider. So in fact, uh, in, in line with my previous uh, experience uh, on this content, uh, DeepL uh, was chosen as the preferred vendor for French, uh, and I believe it was the same for German as well. Yep, so both DeepL uh, in this case. So you can see how this works. This could also have gone a whole different way uh, with maybe one language going one way in a different MT provider uh, while uh, the other one went maybe to DeepL, right? And and so again, uh, fully automated in that aspect and you don't have to worry about your MT strategy essentially or, or vetting who is the best at the moment or who's made improvements and, and now has taken the lead in a certain content domain, right? And in addition to that, we also provide you metrics. So if you're really interested in diving deeper into performance data, uh, you can uh, subscribe to our uh, Snowflake integration that allows you then to ultimately also um, visualize that data and, and measure over time, like the performance of different models on your content. Um, let me close these jobs out. So pretend the providers actually completed their post editing work here. And then subsequent to that, we'll see the, the deliveries going back to HubSpot. So I'll go jump back out here. And as with Dirk, this is for us a general environment where we do a lot of testing as well as some demonstrations. So you'll see maybe some interesting names. 
of pages and content, but uh, this might take a second or two. Okay, now languages are here, and we can see that uh, both were returned. And similar to Dirk's uh, blog post, um, we have now a translation in German, and the same is really true for French. So, yeah, with that, uh, I think I've I've completed my part of the demo, uh, and I can hand back to uh, Paul. Amazing device. Thank you very much. Really interesting. I'll just get my uh, side of things set up. Uh, just bear with me one second. Okay. Um, so as I, uh, yeah, thank you, uh, dear Tobias, uh, for the last session uh, you had me, uh, then followed by the, uh, the Q&A session. So um, as I discussed at the beginning of the webinar, uh, Deepal commissioned a, uh, a survey uh, with the goal of understanding how marketers deal with uh, localizing content in their business. Um, we uh, received 415 responses, uh, all from marketers uh, who were responsible in some way uh, for their company's translation and localization workflows. And it's also worth pointing out that uh, the survey was completed, uh, was completely independent. So uh, at no point was Deepal mentioned uh, and didn't contain any Deepal branding. So uh, the questions and answers completely impartial. And I have some details there about how that uh, 415 responses uh, were split. So uh, we can get into the uh, details. I won't bore you with uh, uh, death by PowerPoint. So uh, a lot of the, uh, uh, the stats here, feel free to read through and I'll just go through uh, sort of the key headlines as to uh, what we found and what we, uh, what we got from this. So uh, firstly, uh, yeah, the, what we found was the sheer number of people involved in the, uh, the translation and localization process uh, is a huge frustration for uh, marketers. Um, organizations and teams that translate content are striving to find better ways of reducing the headcount uh, you know, from all of their uh, workflows, uh, especially when working with uh, cross-functional teams and, uh, and, and technical staff trying to uh, optimize that as much as possible. Uh, translating content is uh, generally found to be profitable uh, across the business landscape with a uh, good return on investment. Uh, irrespective of uh, tools and methods uh, used for uh, translation and localization. Uh, on the flip side, uh, with the more in-depth uh, data that we have, uh, we found that the, uh, the results indicated that the, the costs obviously increase when uh, human reviews and human in the loop uh, workflows are introduced. Uh, and that obviously begins eating away at the, uh, the return of investment uh, uh, achieved by just using uh, some form of uh, machine translation. Uh, hot topic at the moment, obviously generative AI uh, continues to be a huge topic and uh, from what we see it isn't going away anytime soon. Uh, rather than it just being a gimmick or a tech demo, uh, marketers are using it as uh, commercial AI tools to augment their workflows and the indication is that uh, this area is only set to uh, increase over the next two to three years. So on this side, there's a fair bit of uh, interconnected information to uh, sift through, so I'll uh, uh, try and break it down. Uh, what we can see is that uh, manual revisions without any help from uh, machine translation tools can take up a, a serious amount of uh, project's time. Uh, that can be reduced considerably when using additional translation tools like uh, glossaries uh, to substitute jargon or domain-specific words. Uh, interestingly, although custom models are often considered to be a step in the right direction to increase translation accuracy, uh, the results indicate that uh, they can actually uh, might, might actually extend uh, translation projects uh, time to completion. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, use of custom models might actually uh, be reserved for more complex projects where you know, the 20 hours uh, that are spent with human editing uh, still re represents uh, an efficiency improvement compared to not using custom models uh, at all. Uh, as factors uh, such as accuracy, performance and language support, uh, they become expected commodities with machine translation. Uh, it's interesting to see that uh, support for specific document types uh, comes out on top. Uh, in addition to data security and API capability, it's clear that criteria for choosing machine translation vendor is highly specialized and it needs to have the right technical tooling to uh, produce the best results. And then obviously with a vendor in place, expectations for machine translation have a high bar to meet. Uh, speed and accuracy have become non-negotiable requirements uh, as expected. Uh, 
uh, what's the scalability of translations and ultimately the return on investment being generated uh, become part of the differentiating mix uh, to aid customer retention and, uh, machine, and uh, for machine translation vendors. And then savvy marketers uh, understand the power of using machine translation in their localization workflows and the benefits that they bring, uh, you know, recognizing not only the speed and accuracy uplift, but also freeing up hours of human review uh, time and obviously deploying their staff on uh, much more meaningful, interesting tasks. And of course, uh, unfortunately, uh, machine translation isn't yet 100% accurate. It's not, it's not there with 100% uh, human translation. Uh, right now, marketers are using uh, human review, uh, incorporating a human review into their workflows in order to nail uh, those final few issues uh, to make their translations uh, as perfect as possible. Uh, although there's already a high expectation placed on accuracy, it's interesting to see that uh, the more subtle, fa subtle factors such as uh, nuance and tone uh, still require that, uh, that human touch. And lastly, uh, most marketers from our survey aren't just uh, doing this alone. Uh, they're supported by uh, an ecosystem of uh, technologists and advertisers. Uh, and advisors, sorry, who strive to make uh, local, the localization process uh, simpler using machine translation. Uh, and uh, uh, that's uh, and that's it from me. Uh, again, if you want to get in contact, please do. Uh, it's my details. And we shall move on to the Q and A. So. I'll stop sharing my screen. I believe we've had quite a few in. Uh, Dirk, I think the, there were a couple um, that actually started uh, that came in before you. Um, obviously, demoing the, uh, uh, the machine translation uh, workflows. Uh, do you have any details on how incorporating the uh, a human in the loop into that workflow would actually look? Sure. Um, so I don't I don't have a demo prepared for that, um, but I can I can certainly sketch out um, the process. So uh, the moment that there is sort of a, a human in the loop component, uh, we would want to involve um, a cat tool or a TMS. Um, this will be somewhat similar to what Tobias showed in, in his presentation, um, where the content would automatically be uh, be added to uh, to a project in in the transaction management system. Um, where then you know the the sort of pre-populated machine translation um, would be made available to to the reviewers. Reviewers can be both internal or external uh, to the company. That really depends on the language, the target language. As I mentioned in the presentation, we don't have a full on coverage for all of the languages that we might translate uh, content into. Um, but it can also be in internal reviewers, and um, you know, for for especially like high impact or um, I want to say very context specific content, we would typically review internally. So developer documentation, for example, would be something that, um, you know, you need a fair amount of sort of subject matter knowledge on uh, um, of in order to review it. But other than that, the process is pretty much the same. Um, obviously, with the with the human component in there, uh, it's not instantaneously, which is why it doesn't make for a good demo. Um, but um, there would be there would be then a, a delay for however long it takes for uh, for the reviewers to finish that. We at this point have kind of stopped short of automating that to the umpteenth degree. Like we could technically automate that a little bit more in the sense uh, that um, you know you could you could just have sort of a, a standing project and whenever content is is imported into it right like you just send a message you send a notification to the reviewers hey here's a here's a new review um this this is due for friday um that's definitely doable uh but we at this point have stopped short of doing that uh, just because the moment that there's a sort of an outsourcing component and a human in the loop component involved there are concerns around you know budgets capacities, capacity limits, volume limits, and so on. Um, so we, at this point, prefer to have, um, at that point, uh, have one of our project managers look over it. And typically what we, with our human in the loop use cases, what we settle in is usually a weekly cadence where um, it, instead of 
uh, translating everything instantaneously, like I showed in the demo, um, we would go look at, we would filter for, let's, let's say, um, assets that were updated last week. We pull those into, into the translation management system, and that sort of then becomes a review project um, for, uh, for our reviewers. So um, there's, there's always a little bit of a trade-off there, I suppose, in terms of um, how thorough you want the review to be and how quick the turnaround time needs to be. Uh, depending on the, the use case, depending on the content type, uh, turnaround time might take precedence. Um, so that's something that, that you know, has to be weighed for each individual use case. That's great, Adil. Thank you very much. Um, and Tobias, I, I guess this is kind of following on from that, but um, uh, do you have detail in, in terms of the workflow for phrase? Do you have uh, details or could you go into any information about who actually re uh, reviews like the machine translation results? Obviously, is, is it left pretty much autonomously, or is there a is there some kind of uh, review process in place? Yeah, and I mean, in the phrase platform, you can decide how that happens, right? So we showed the integration here today with with HubSpot, but um, you know, ultimately you could guide content depending on what the content is uh, to a specific uh, vendor or internal linguist, let's say for human review. And, and that's up to your choice. You can template that or pre-template that. It could be a group of, of individuals as well. So uh, it could be first come first serve or time-based uh, laps where you know one gets an invitation and then if that person doesn't pick it up, a subsequent gets one and so on. Uh, so it can be as involved as you want, really. That's great, thank you. Um, uh, just looking down the questions. So, um, uh, question here, um, I guess, device, I'll stay with you uh, and Dirk, yeah, feel free to chip in with this as well. Uh, what do you think of the challenges uh, for global translation with the rise of unstructured language like uh, so, social, uh, social media sources? Uh, I don't know, Dirk, you wanna go first? <laughs> Sure. Um, so what we've seen in the past is that, you know, these these are um, a the use cases where like raw machine translation typically comes into play. Um, the kind of user generated content, unstructured content that where it's really mostly a, a question of can we provide some translation out of sheer convenience or, or like just, uh, you know, so that, that there is something there that could hopefully be be helpful to someone who, who does not speak the original language. Um, and uh, I guess the, the, on the flip side, there is the use case of using this content as like training material, um, be that for like a machine translation or nowadays, I guess, for, for large language models, um, which I find a questionable use case, but, um, you know, that's I guess that's for the individual providers to decide whether the, whether or not they want that headache, um, and whether the out uh, the output quality is is what they would what they were looking for. Yeah, I guess uh, maybe to add to that, uh, I know that there's uh, in in an, in another part of this session, there's going to be a discussion around unstructured content. So not to take away too much from that discussion, um, but yeah, there definitely are complexities with that content, right? We we know UG content, there can be shorthand idioms, things that are really difficult to translate. And how does an MT system really do a good job at that, right? MT systems tend to tend to be trained on on structured content mostly, maybe some unstructured for noise, but but ultimately, they excel really well on unstructured content, right? Um, and uh, nuances and uh, like linguistic nuances and, and cultural nuances really are hard to pick up, right? They're really difficult to to tackle. Um, perhaps there's other technologies we can get to the second part, probably where we discuss that uh, that can solve this better. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, there's also a, qu a question here from the attendees. Um, and again, to both of you, really, uh, what would you recommend to traditional translators um, to do in terms of updating their knowledge? I guess that's, you know, seeing the, the influx of uh, you know, machine translation, I guess, how, how would you recommend for them to, uh, to stay relevant in a technology era? Yeah, I mean, that, that's a question that, that, you know, has been asked a lot. I, will, I would say, uh, 
first off, like don't let the current sort of hype machine like uh, get you down, uh, right? Like we, especially in the localization industry, uh, we have kind of been there before, right? Like with sort of the advent of, of neural machine translation um, in 2016 and beyond. Um, it very much felt like the moment that we're in right now with generative AI and, and large language models. And, um, you know, there's a lot of, obviously a lot of digital ink being spilled, um, sort of prophesizing the end of uh, this and that profession. Um, I wouldn't, I, I don't, I, I'm not seeing that, I must say. Um, specialization in post-editing is kind of tricky because uh, the whole deal with post-editing is typically that um, the return is probably not as good. Um, it is it is something that you should have in your portfolio, I would say, for sure. Um, like if, if, you know, you, you need to, I guess be have sort of a broad portfolio of things that you can that you can provide um, for people, unless you are in the very fortunate situation that you are a hyper specialized translator and you know you are translating you are the one translator who does legal translation from Icelandic into Turkish then you know you probably should stick with that niche, um, but uh, for for a sort of more general purpose, um, I would say the big p the, the big thing is from my side is like don't like don't close yourself off to the technology at least explore the options that are there um and it kind of goes to the to the last slide that i had my i had in my presentation that the kind of like finding options to provide additional value um to stakeholders is is i think the big piece and that can be sort of a consultative approach um and you know if a lot of the a lot of the translation buyers out there um do not necessarily have um have a lot of expertise for for translation and localization on their side so if you can fill that gap if you can provide that information i think that's that's a really um th that's that's a very reasonable thing to to try to to develop your your sort of expertise and knowledge in okay thank you very much um Device, I believe uh, have you booked a question that uh, you'd like to pick up on? Uh, yeah, sure, Ned. So, um, well, one, um, yeah, Memster is now phrase TMS. Just, just to make sure, uh, I would say regarding your question around, you know, are we an advanced provider regarding translation memories and so on? Uh, I would say we are. Uh, you know. Our platform is essentially cloud-based, so everything happens there real time. Uh, people can collaborate in an online environment and 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 you know essentially leverage their, each other's work uh, very effectively um, and efficiently. And it's ultimately an environment that most people find very appealing when it comes to simplicity and an understanding and easy to learn, quick to learn, and work in uh, with everything that most people want right so there's always going to be something that somebody wants that's not there uh, but i think the wider majority of, of users really appreciate what we have um and from an mt and an ai integration perspective yes we certainly are i would say as a company uh that's one of our our sweet spots i think is is mt enablement uh and ai technology integration so we have multiple different technologies around ai not just phrase translate but there's additional things like mtqe scoring you saw it a little bit today if you caught it uh, on the editor uh you have you know we have also non-translatables i didn't discuss so we we also have a field content that typically never gets translated and that happens by target language or, or source target locale um in addition to that we also broaden that's not so much ai yet um but there is our, our low code no code environment that we uh, deployed which is orchestrator and with that now we can do things like content routing of content that really uh is requires human review rather than content that maybe it's the, the quality level expectation is not that high uh, or it's not, it doesn't have to be excellent, but it has to be good enough, let's say, right? And we can measure that now and automate that processing so that the content can be routed to a human when it's needed. Not everything has to go to a human, even things that are perfect, right, or good enough. Um, so these are the things we're, we're investing further in. And of course, other things as well that are mainstream nowadays and, and concern the entire industry. And we're always sort of at the you know, at the forefront of, of that and looking at how we intelligently weave this stuff into a platform that's easy to use. Perfect, thank you. Um, I'm just going to bring in a question uh, uh, that I had, um, kind of linking it back to the survey uh, results. And obviously when we're looking at 
is obviously a huge amount of uh, uh, the survey respondents that are still using um, human in the loop. You know, we can see that uh, you know, perfect machine translation doesn't exist right now. Um, but I guess question to both of you, what, what do you think, with a little bit of future gazing, what do you think the, the next iterations are for, uh, for machine, machine translation in, in that sort of that golden path to, uh, uh, to absolute 100% accuracy? Twice, I'll let you carry on. As soon as uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah, I would say you know the the quality is ever improving. I think we've measured over time. We put out our MT report that showcases this as well, and the adoption is ever increasing. Actually, um, I, I would say there's been more of an explosion in in recent years in terms of quality, uh, and it, the trajectory trajectory of improvements has actually grown quite quickly. Uh, and I think that will continue to a degree. I don't think I don't see that flattening out just yet. Um, you know, now we're talking generative AI and how generative AI can maybe be in, integrated into this whole mix, right, of things. I don't think it's going to need necessarily to take the the place of MT. I don't think MT is much more efficient at doing what it does, uh, but it has its place, right? And so when you combine things and, and make use of all the tools that are built, that's when uh, even more uh, improvements can come 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 your way. Um, ultimately, then maybe segueing back to what Dirk Dirk sort of responded to, like the the concern around my linguistic job as a linguist, what was what what's my future look like, right? And I think uh, I second Dirk sort of uh, stance of. You know, embrace what's there from a technology perspective and use it to your advantage, really. Um, it's more about the content volume you can produce with these tools than the fact that you may be out of business. Because I think from a volume perspective, there's more volume than can even still be handled reasonably. And we need systems like this to even bring content out to the wider masses, right? From both a budgetary perspective and also a speed perspective. So there's always going to be an element for linguists, but the job will change. And I think you have to move with it. Otherwise, if you try to stay with the old school translation, I think it will be problematic in the future. I would I would add to that that there are so one thing that um that I guess the the wider public is uh, is now kind of slowly realizing. I think we will see sort of a mirroring with a lot of the what the language industry went through with uh, with the introduction of neural machine translation. We will see a lot of that happen with um, with generative AI and large language models. Right, right now everyone is sort of very high on the hype cycle. Like we'll need to see where where the we land once the dust settles. But I think one of the big uh, I guess realizations that came out of the introduction of, of, of NMT and then really sort of the propagation and, and adoption of, of NMT um, is the fact that there are certain things where you will want, you will pretty much always want to have uh, humans in the loop, if only for legal liability reasons, right? Um, there's always, we, you know, headlines are coming out every day of like, uh, I don't know, states attorneys writing their legal briefs, having chat GPT writing their legal briefs and it, it falling completely flat, right? Because it hallucinated some precedent that doesn't exist. Um, so that that's, I think, something that, that will stick around. Um, Tobias is definitely correct when he says, you know, it, it will often become a thing, a question about the productivity that you can, that you can bring into that, which, I uh, I can see how that you know how that might not gel with everyone's sort of uh, you know sense of um, or, or sort of personal preference or or sense of where things should be going, but I think the real the real big um, fallout from the introduction of generative AI is still upon us, and that is like there has been a if I don't quote me on this these numbers, but as far as I know. Uh, in the past like decade or so, every two years, roughly, the number of data that um, has been created by all of humankind in all of its history has doubled every two years, right? Like generative AI is gonna, like that is gonna go parabolic um, because at least for the time being, everyone will continue to follow the same kind of playbooks, which means more content, more languages, more, 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 more. Um, so we're not hurting for volumes. That's that's for sure. Um, and the the real question is really like uh, how how do we keep up with that and to a reasonable standard? Um, 
regarding the quality, I, I would completely echo what, what Tobias said. Like, I don't think we're nowhere at the ceiling yet. Um, I would say like progress will, will slow down over time a bit. Um, and, you know, ultimately like what, can machine translation ever be perfect? Like that is pretty much of a moot point because what is a perfect translation, right? Like ask five translators and you will get five opinions what the perfect translation is. So um, there is no such thing. Um, but will it get to a point where it can be used for more and more like different types of content without without needing additional review? Yeah, we're probably going to get there. That's great. Thank you very much. And I guess that uh, I've got a follow on question there. You kind of answered it in, in a way, but uh, uh, I guess, uh, Dirk, I'll, I'll stick with you. Do you see um, uh, what, what do you think in terms of like using generative AI and combining mm. that with uh, machine translation? Um, I guess where we are right now in, in, in terms of history, what, what do you see as the immediate sort of positives and negatives of, of combining those two technologies? Yeah. Um, so I will say like, I'm not aware of any sort of, I guess, killer application of, of generative AI and localization as of yet. Um, there are some very promising some very promising directions that that you know different tool providers and so on are experimenting with, and obviously like companies are in, uh, experimenting with internally. Um, as of right now, again, I would I would echo what Tobias said. It's not like it won't replace machine translation. Machine translation models are way too way too efficient um, at what they do in order to be replaced by the current generation of large language models. Um, that being said, large language models have a couple of things where they are. Or couple, there are a couple of elements where they are better than typical machine translation models. Uh, fluency is obviously the big thing. Accuracy is not so much their strong suit, um, but uh, the fluency piece is is really quite remarkable. The ability to deal with noisy source content is quite remarkable, um, and that's kind of where I see the applications right now is turning, like adding a, another layer. Uh, to improve the content quality of of machine translation output, that's kind of where I think um, most of you know most of the sort of investigations are happening right now. Um, that's anything from rephrasing, rewriting, shortening text, transforming text in any any way, right? Like you could use it to introduce inclusive language, um, to to clean up uh, uh, source content that is too noisy. Um, I'm really interested to see like how well it can be used for um or terminology work um something that that i want to look into at, at hubspot is um can we use generative ai for example to uh to write a report for us for where it thinks things um it um it finds like terminology or quality issues in in machine uh, translated output and kind of point reviewers to that um that I think could be could be really interesting, and that's kind of similar to what we've seen with automated quality um, automated quality est uh, estimations. And I'm wondering if that can be a little bit further to like a a as much as, as like, hey, have a look at the sentence, the terminology, and is it wrong? That would be pretty cool. That's great, thank you, uh, Tobias. I didn't know whether you had any thoughts on that. Yeah, I, I I definitely agree uh, on a lot of points that Dirk made. Um, actually, by the way, the the terminology thing that you're talking about, we can do. Um, so we can talk <laughs> about. Um, uh, ultimately, yeah, I believe. Uh, you know, if you think about it, generative AI, like it has its strengths, and I think they're really different from 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 machine translation. It it, you know, looking at summarizing content, giving me an idea of what the content's about. So like from a tooling perspective, or even like assisting a linguist, I could see like a linguist is stuck maybe with wording and is sitting on this one segment, right? They can't figure out how to word it just right, right? And and that happens sometimes in the, in the process, right? Of creative writing or something like that even. Uh, and you need just that gist, that boost, right? And you can you could easily ask, for instance, generative AI, give me some ideas around how to rephrase this this concept, right, in different ways, and maybe give me three ideas of different ways to describe this in my language and my target language. 
and boom, now you have three options and that may help the linguist even further develop uh, the final version, right? And so sometimes it's just that nudge that's needed to, to get you know your brain to the next gear and it'll get past the problem. And, and generative AI really can help in that respect. Uh, machine translation really doesn't, right? It's it's usually comes up with one translation in in, in that sense. Um, so applications like that, and 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 others as well, like like Dirk mentioned, also you know, is the content actually ready for a certain audience? Maybe that could be evaluated. Is the content right? Is the content you know think about learning? Uh, you know, even teaching for for children or for adults, right? From a different uh, educational level, is it geared towards a certain educational level? Is it geared towards um, like a sixth grader, eighth grader, uh, undergrad or grad student level, right? Um, uh, thinking more also about different types of content, like scientific versus, um, you know, like purely business and stuff like that. Like, can uh, generative AI help there in essentially assessing whether quality is actually good from a translation perspective, thinking about the, the actual content and whether it is geared towards a scientific audience versus maybe one for a general consumer business business contact. Yeah, this, this actually goes to one of the questions that was asked um, earlier in... LLMs are very good to, I guess, adopt a persona um, for their for their output, right? Like I'm, I'm sure everyone has seen, you know, articles for prompts like, you know, that that go like, oh, you know, render this the the reply as if you are, you know, five years old, whatever it might be, um, and that sort of thing. I think is is where where the use cases are going to be, making sure that it's appropriate for the target audience. I would also mention that what what Tobias mentioned, right, like the rephrasing piece, um, could also be applied to the source. Um, if let's say you have you as a translator, you have you have a, a source segment that you're struggling with. Maybe it's like super strong on the industry jargon, um, and you can't make heads or tails of it. That could be a very good uh, a very good way to like try to get a better understanding of it. Um, one thing that I wanted to to add to the discussion is that I think uh, what we will see with generative AI and large language models is also a, um, obviously it will have a big impact down the line on marketing strategies and how we think about web content. Um, in fact, I'm I'm fairly sure that it will kind of flip the current playbooks on its on its head, but it was a little bit too early to tell how how that will end. Um, but I think that means for for people working in the language space as well, um, that different approaches uh, to like that that there will definitely be more of a content creation aspect um, in in your translation, so to speak. Um, so the 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 the, uh, the borders between translating and and content creation. Um, will will blur even more. Um, I could very much see um, sort of a AI powered trans creation based on some original source content um, becoming becoming sort of a, a service that that will be more sought after. Um, and the same goes for restructuring of content. So let's say you have you have you know your set of blog posts in in the source language, and rather than going one one by one for everyone. Um, maybe on the on the target language side, what we're looking for is um, is a summary or a you know a ten page document that kind of goes through the most important pieces out of those fifty block uh, blog posts, and th those are the kinds of things that LLMs tend to be quite fairly good at the sort of summarization and 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 um, re reshuffling of the information. That's great. Thank you very much, Dick. And I appreciate we're right up at the end of time now. So uh, appreciate uh, the time, Tobias and Dirk, for your uh, insights and presentations. It's been absolutely fantastic. Uh, many thanks to Mike in the background. I appreciate you haven't had to do much, but thank you for being here. Uh, apologies for any of the technical uh, difficulties we've had along the way, but uh, thanks to everybody uh, who attended. Uh, obviously, I think there's been a couple of questions. We will get the, uh, the link to the webinar out to uh, everybody, whether they've uh, attended uh, or not, so that will be sent out. And uh, thanks very much for uh, joining us, and uh, see you next time. Thank you very much. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.